So without any uh, further ado, so as not to take up any more of his time, uh, I'll leave you to Eric. Uh, the Great Divide, Sociology, Anthropology and Race in France. It's Levi Strauss. And the reason I'm particularly interested in listening to this is it shows uh, not only cross-disciplinary divisions, but intra-disciplinary divisions. Uh, and uh, the way that things sort of bud out of each other and blend is not really properly understood by the notion of boundary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first, I'm very pleased and honored glad to be here. And uh, so thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, but also I'd like to thank Sunya. Nearby, uh, and, and for um, accepting to, to comment on a paper she has also read. Um, this is called um, The Great Divide, which means it could be called No Knots uh, or Not Knots, uh, but Buts, of course. Um, and it's about untying the knots, actually, uh, between sociology and anthropology. And, and my effort has been to recreate uh, these uh, ties. And so when I speak as a sociologist, uh, it's an old style of sociologist. That is not only because I'm not using PowerPoint, but also perhaps even more importantly, uh, because it's before the great divide that I'm describing, the divide between sociology and anthropology, that I place my own work. Even though I work on race today, uh, I will focus on a moment, which is the early 1950s. Uh, as a turn, a turning point um, uh, embodied by Claude Levi Strauss, and I hope this has some relevance after you listen to from the disco yesterday uh, for some of you. Um, the reason why I will focus on France, uh, even though much of my work has been on circulations, international circulations, and in particular, even though my work and, and political effort has been, in many ways, to introduce within the French context uh, concepts of gender and race that were presumed to be alien to French culture. Uh, the reason why I will focus on France uh, is because I hope that uh, it will sort of provide a way of thinking about what is unthinkable, uh, what is sort of left out of the conversation and why it is that it's left out of the conversation. And uh, of course I, I believe that uh, the discussion with the Sunya will uh, help uh, not stay in France and, and open uh, boundaries, uh, which is the point. <coughs> Finally, as, as a final preliminary note, um, much of my work is about gender. There will be no gender in my presentation whatsoever, except for the fact that, of course, all the people I'm going to talk about are men. Um, and uh, it's about founding fathers. So, no gender. <laughs> <laughs> My, my starting point uh, is the word anthropology. And uh, what I want to do is to not assume that we know what it means, but see the moment when it took on uh, a new meaning with uh, Lady Strauss. That will be the first part of my presentation. So it's a genealogy of current uses of the word anthropology. But at the same time, uh, what I want to do is to suggest that this uh, figure of speech, uh, anthropology, uh, in the 1950s emerged uh, in a context that had to do with race, or rather with the erasure of race. And so it will be an archaeology of racial issues of, in the French context. So these are the two sections of my presentation, and hopefully uh, I won't get lost, so that you won't get lost in my presentation. So the first part is about this genealogy of the word anthropology. Uh, and the foundation of anthropology as a discipline uh, by Claude Strauss in the 1950s. The Elementary Structures of Kinship uh, was published in 1949, and it is considered by many to be a sort of Bible uh, for anthropology. Indeed, it was used as a Bible in the conversations about gay marriage in the late uh, 1990s, when people opposing uh, gay marriage in France uh, invoked uh, the, the, the work of Claude Levi Strauss to say that he showed it is impossible uh, to open affiliation to same sex couples because it takes a man and a woman to have a child. 
um, which apparently cannot be found in the complete words of the Levi Strauss, as they confirmed. But what it means is that it could, use, it could be used as a sort of transcendent authority upon which we could rely. Um, you could use the Bible in the National Assembly, but you could use the uh, Toledo Levi Strauss for much better purposes. Uh, what is interesting is that this book, which is a sort of founding moment for anthropology, does not uh, define Claude Levi Strauss as an anthropologist. He doesn't say that he speaks as an anthropologist, he speaks as a sociologist when he writes in the late 1940s. Uh, the preface in 1947. Uh, ends uh, with a sentence with the word uh, sociology and, and the chapter uh, on, on nature and culture is also about comparative sociology. So it's all about sociology, not about anthropology. The only way anthropology occurs is in reference to American cultural anthropology as distinct from the French tradition. But of course it makes sense because Louis Strauss just spent a few years in the US during the war for reasons that are return to, but then have to do war. Uh, he uh, pays homage to uh, the memory of Lewis H. Morgan and to the anthropological uh, school in America. Uh, so for him, there is no divide between sociology and anthropology, or if there is one, uh, it is a national one. It is not within France, it's between France and the US. Now this is not specific uh, to Levi Strauss. In fact, all the Durkheimian tradition uh, insists that there's just one social science. Um, if you consider the book like the Elementary Forms of Religious Life, which is often considered to be an anthropological reference, uh, it was written as a sociology. Uh, or if you think of the, the famous article by Rosen Durkheim, Primitive Forms of Classification, it was published in L'Anne Sociologie. So it's all sociology. Does that mean that the word anthropology did not exist? Of course not, it did exist. Uh, but when Durkheim talks about anthropology, he's talking about a group within sociology. Uh, when he surveys sociological studies in France uh, in the late uh, 19th century, in 1895, he distinguish, distinguishes between three groups, the anthropological group, the criminological group, and the academic group, and he belongs to the third one. Uh, and, and so the anthropological group is people like Paul Bolka, and as he says, anthropology is mostly uh, worried about races. So anthropology is about race at the time when Durkheim is writing, which is not what sociology is about. Uh, <coughs> It's mostly about physical anthropology, but for example, if you see Durkheim reviewing a book in Germany, about, about uh, a German book, uh, which calls itself anthropological, he's surprised. He says the author um, is, is in fact giving the term anthropology, but uh, the term sociology seems to be more appropriate. That is, basically, Germans don't quite know what they're doing. Uh, they should know, since they should read Durkheim, that it's about sociology. There is no difference on this point between Durkheim and Moos. Uh, Moos uh, insists there is one social science which is called sociology. Uh, so when he creates uh, an institute of ethnology in 1925, that's because ethnology is a technique that belongs to sociology, not a separate discipline. On the other hand, he complains or he, he mourns the fact that uh, in other countries there's a rivalry between sociology and anthropology. He says, in England, in the US, sociology suffers from the rivalry of what is called social anthropology. Now, um, there's also another meaning of the word anthropology with most. Um, it's anthropology as a complete knowledge of the human being. Uh, so it's about everything. Uh, it includes sociology, but it also includes biology, it includes everything. So it's the knowledge of man. This is what Levi Strauss will pick up on. Not so much the cultural anthropology, uh, but in fact uh, the anthropology as a sort of universal uh, science. Because this text uh, that insists on the fact that you have this uh, overarching anthropology uh, was not well known until it was republished in 1950, <coughs> just after the death of Marcel Mauss. 
uh, in a volume that is interestingly, and I will uh, say more about this, that is interestingly called Sociology and Anthropology. Uh, it's with this volume, and, and you may recall that there was not one volume by most available before that. So most, in many ways, started as an author the year of his death. Uh, and and uh, he um, became an author through this label, Sociology and Anthropology, mm -hmm. and could thus become a, a reference for anthropologists uh, as distinct from sociology. Mm -hmm. uh, which means uh, what uh, Lady Strauss is doing is, in a way, getting rid of an intellectual mistake uh, mistaking race for a reality, uh, but he's not disputing the political order. He's not undermining the colonial world. Uh, if we want to understand what Levi Strauss is doing in something specific, we have to look at what was going on at the same time. Think of the work of Georges Balantier. Georges Balantier, uh, who later uh, called himself an anthropologist, but at that time called himself a sociologist. And so in the Cahier International de Sociologie, in 1951, so it's all the same moment, uh, he published a very influential text on the colonial situation. In that text, he presents himself, of course, as a sociologist, uh, and he's critical of anthropologists, by saying, uh, it's only very unevenly that anthropologists have taken into consideration uh, the context that we can call the colonial situation. So in many ways, anthropology is accused by Balanthi of neglecting the fact that the cultures they're studying are not just cultures, they're societies in a colonial situation. So the, den the denial of the colonial situation is, is the gist of uh, Balanthi's argument. So he says, you have on the one hand some scholars who are obsessed by the pursuit of the pure ethnological fact, uh, unaltered and miraculously preserved in its primitiveness, or uh, scholars who are exclusively avid of theoretical speculation, and you can picture the kind of people he's thinking about. On the other hand, uh, you have scholars who are uh, committed to practical investigations, applied uh, sociology or anthropology, uh, purely empirical. And so what he's trying uh, is to establish a position that is neither purely empirical nor purely anthropological, and to account for what is going on, and that means paying attention to the historical, political context. And as you know, um, he claims, Balladier claims, uh, that he's one of the creators uh, of the word uh, third world. So, in fact, thinking about the colonial situation is thinking about the geopolitics of culture and race. Uh, at the same time, he publishes, or a few years later, he publishes his Sociologie Actuelle de la Rue Noire. So it's a current sociology. It's about the present, whereas anthropology uh, tended to be timeless, outside of time. So that's to show there's an alternative way of thinking about what is going on at the time, uh, not in terms of culture, but in terms of the colonial situation. However, uh, Valéry is not talking about race either. No one is talking about race. Or rather, uh, I, I will show that those who speak about race will be sort of left out of the picture, uh, starting from that moment. Um, it's interesting to note that Valéry himself who then defines himself as a sociologist and who will be considered less important, less interesting, even though he will be very influential, uh, will later, uh, that is starting in the 1960s, start speaking about himself as an anthropologist and to write uh, books about political anthropology, for example, that leave out the colonial situation. So the way to become an anthropologist is to leave out politics, is to leave out history, and to go global, to go universal, to go Lady Strauss. Um,
it was possible to talk about race and the colonial situation at the very same time. Uh, but interestingly, the people who did uh, have not been considered relevant in those discussions. The most obvious case is that of Emile Cizé. Uh, as you know, Cizé is not just a writer, he's a politician. Uh, he was a, a writer and a politician. And he published in 1915 uh, a discourse on colonialism uh, that was very important. And as you can see, it's all the same dates, it's the same moment. It's a fight, a struggle about how to represent what is going on after World War II and in the context of decolonization or imminent decolonization. So his discourse on colonialism in 1950 uh, makes a direct connection between race uh, in the Nazi context and race in the colonial context. And I agree, um, he says, it would be very interesting to reveal to the very distinguished, very humanistic, very Christian bourgeois of the 20th century that he carries within himself a Hitler uh, that does not uh, acknowledge himself. So there's a connection between the white bourgeoisie and Hitler. In the end, what he, this white bourgeois, is not willing to forgive uh, Hitler is not the crime per se, the crime against humankind. It's not the humiliation of man. It's the crime against the white man. <coughs> it's the humiliation of the white man. That is, applying to Europe colonial logics that until then had only been used against Arabs in Algeria, against coolies in India, against Negroes, I'm using a 1950s term, in Africa. <coughs> Today, you can't say that in France, uh, because the whole point is that we live after the 1950s, after the Lévis Strauss moment, and so the idea that you can compare the colonial situation with a Nazi situation has in many ways become taboo, and this is when it happens in the first part of the 1950s, because of the exceptional nature of the crimes of Nazism, the idea that colonialism has something to do with that uh, is precisely what has become unthinkable. Uh, clearly, if you start saying today what Césaire was saying then, you're accused of being anti-Semitic, that is, of denying the reality of Nazi extermination of the Jews, or of minimizing it. Important, of course, also in the first person for Lévi Strauss as someone who left France uh, and because of the persecutions against Jews. So his discovery of anthropology in the US is very much linked to that both personal and historical experience. Uh, but at the same time, it was possible, and this is the second part of my genealogy of, of, of archaeology of race, uh, the, 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 my point is that this was not the only discourse possible. This was not the only discourse available. It's the one that prevailed. Uh, so what we know is what happened as a consequence of this. And this is what I want to end with. In many ways, uh, I believe that this accounts for the fact that it has been so difficult to speak about race in France. Because in fact, discussions about race have been discussions about racism. Uh, and not about the politics of race. There have been discussions, for example, about Nazism, and so the fears that there may be echoes of the past and the present, but it has been much more difficult to, to think not in terms of Nazi ideology or its new forms, but of practices. Practices that produce race uh, through segregation, through relegation, uh, through everyday discrimination. And produce race in the sense, first, that people don't live in the same places, but also that they don't have the same um, everyday experiences. That is, depending on your skin color or last name or neighborhood, you do not have the same experience with the police, for example. Now, this I say in the context of, which is that of the celebrations, so to speak, 
uh, that start now in France of the riots or uprising, uprisings that took place 10 years ago in the French suburbs. Um, as you know, these were perceived partly or mostly as racial riots. Uh, and so it's interesting to see what is going on in France today in that context. The fact that it's so difficult to talk about race in the sense of Lévis, in the sense of Césaire, uh, and that it's only in the sense of lévis uh, that is related to Nazi ideologies or its new uh, versions, uh, this, I think, makes it very difficult to make sense of what happened 10 years ago. In particular, uh, what you can see is that um, there's a rise in open racism in France, but at the same time, the main response that has been uh, supported by the left, uh, first by then candidate François Hollande when he was running for president, and today by the Front Gauche, which is supposed to be more on the left, the only response they've given is said is saying, let's get rid of the word race. Uh, in particular, that was the suggestion of, of François Hollande for the Constitution, where there's an article that says, without any distinction of race. And so let's get rid of the term race. That is, let's get rid of, without any distinction of race, in practice. Uh, and this is what the Front Gauche is today doing for, for not the Constitution, but for legislation. And everyone thinks, this is great. This is great because we don't like race, because we're not racists. But you can see the confusion between the ideology of race, so the critique uh, raised by Lady Strauss, and something else, which is using race to describe policies, to describe practices. So I'll end this and open for your comments and the discussion, but I want to emphasize that these remote discussions about the 1950s uh, and about the history of the word anthropology and all that, for me, are anything but abstract. I very much believe that we live today in France in a world that is defined by that. I have focused on France, but of course my interest has been to sort of point out that there's more to this world than France. Thank you. <laughs>
So it can lead us to a situation where the anthropologist becomes less tolerant of people who are not willing to understand the other, effectively. So, in some ways, what this does is render certain things unthinkable, or at any rate, unsayable. And it's, in a sense, it seems to me, this is what Levi Strauss does to raise in Eric's account. It puts it beyond the pit, it renders it unsayable or unthinkable, and replaces attention to race with attention to culture, and its attendant modes of um, description, explanation, and analysis. So we've been given a very interesting French story, um, and we see how social anthropology is divested of its interest in race and rehabilitated in the aftermath of the horrors of Nazism. And also what seems to drop away here then is a critical engagement with colonialism. <coughs> and what I'd like to do now is to turn here to India and to colonial and post-colonial understandings of race and racism, particularly in the context of caste. In India, the issue is not between sociology and anthropology. There's no great divide there. In fact, um, as several Indian um, sociologists and anthropologists have put it, the feeling in India is that if sociology is the study of the self, and anthropology that of the other, India is simultaneously self and other, and hence sociology and anthropology have always been seen as united. What's at stake in India, really, is the ways in which caste features in academic studies and in questions of governance, and so in the political arena. Now, as early as 1891, Risley produced his monumental work on caste and race in India. Now, his attempt really was to read caste through racial categories that were established by anthropometric techniques. So nasal width, for instance, became a very key indicator of race and of caste, and of indicating people's position in a hierarchy relative to each other. Now this task of keeping caste and race together was taken up by Guri, one of the founding fathers of Indian sociology and social anthropology. And his book in 1924, Race and Caste, really carries on this sort of anthropometric understanding of caste and of race. Now, for, furthermore, on the basis that um, caste is a racial basis and therefore is pan human, one of the things that Guria does is start to look for elements of caste outside Hindu India. So, caste, he's trying to make caste travel essentially. Now, this particular project of getting caste to travel um, through anthropometric understandings of race and caste kind of begins to drop away in later years of Indian sociology. But it does become resurrected in another form in the, at the turn of the 21st century. Now, in independent India, later sociologists um, slash social anthropologists like M. N. Srinivas abandon the question of race. And they start to think about caste, particularly through the medium of village studies. And really what they're doing there with caste is focusing on the interdependence between different castes. So the village is seen as a, mi a microcosm of society and the ways in which different castes are related through these relations of interdependence um, gives you a very particular view of India, uh, a very Hindu view of India and um, of India as a sort of totality of all these different villages where these interdependent relations between caste exist and you can, you can read caste as really interdependence. Now, in its own way, this is as much a political project as Levi Strauss's, I would say, as described by Eric, because it seeks to create, as, so, as Srinivas declared in 1952, so the same year that Race and History is published, a sociology that we want, one that works with the Indian experience, to frame sociological principles that are appropriate for India. So there are elements of methodological nationalism here, and also a nation-building project. One that conflates India with Hinduism and whose main emphasis is interdependence, which is the Indian slogan of unity and diversity. Now, alongside all of this, and partly as a sort of carryover from the colonial period, caste was also an instrument of governance. And this continued to be the case in independent India as well, although um, instead of caste being seen in race terms as it was done in the colonial period and this understanding that 
you know, there's, there, there, there's a hierarchy and people at the top of the hierarchy, which is the highest class people, define what everyone else should be doing and so on, which the British um, colonial rulers took on and transformed in many ways. Um, caste was very important in independent India because that focus on <laughs> interdependence in governments that moves away. And instead what you have are attempts to eliminate what are seen as historical wrongs of caste-based oppression and attempts to eliminate caste-based discrimination. So in that sense, the legitimation of the caste hierarchy through a focus on interdependence gives way to schemes of uplift, um, reform and development. 